Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, this is a stupidly broad title, but it, I wanted to present two different things, and this was the only title that kind of brought it together. So I'm going to talk about something that's more specific than two things that are more specific than this. Um, and I have to mention that most of this work was done in Germany uh, at the uh, Friedrich Alexander Universität in Nuremberg, um, together with some of my colleagues there. Um, so uh, here's a question for you. What do you, if you put yourselves in the place of someone who's thinking about investing in a wind turbine or a gas fired generator, what is the biggest risk that you are, what's the biggest risk that you're worried about? Or the category of risk, or the category of uncertainty? So you say it's just operational, essentially, resource availability. Okay, so there might be something about bias. Anything else? Regulatory changes. That's the one I was hoping someone would say. Um, uh, usually when I ask this question, people think about uh, maybe... So, okay, um, uh, something like what you said, or maybe uh, fuel prices, you know, other inputs. I, I think these things are actually... Things like fuel prices, resource availability, I think they're big uncertainties. I don't think they're big risks because they're very easy to hedge. You know, oil prices are... I can go to a bank and I can, I can get options and whatever not. So, so yeah, it's an uncertainty, but I can, I can hedge it almost perfectly. It's the policy uncertainty that's really, really difficult because it's, it's, it's idiosyncratic risk. Um, uh, policymakers do stupid things. They do unpredictable things. Um, quite often, they are things that I cannot insure myself against. Um, so, so uh, he, he, these are some of the uncertainties I thought of. So there's, there's um, things about future support for renewables, subsidies, feed-in tariffs. Um, I can't predict them because I cannot really predict who's going to be in government five years from now. Um, and remember, these, you know, these, these types of investments, so new wind turbine, especially things like maybe a new nuclear generator, it's going to take 10 years before it's even constructed, and then it's going to be operational for 20 years. So we're looking 30 years into the future, and we can't even predict politics tomorrow. Um, fossil fuel subsidies, quite important in, in many countries. Uh, people tend to forget about them. Um, demand side, inter uh, are we going to have a policy that favors electric vehicles, these kinds of things? But I think especially uh, one type of policy uncertainty that people generally overlook is Uncertainty, not about any of these, all the other things are kind of parameters, you know, they affect my cost, uh, or, I, or they affect the demand, but, but there is uncertainty, policy uncertainty, I think, about what the market will even look like in the future. So this is not an uncertainty about a parameter. It's not like a feed-in tariff, which might be $5, or it might be $10, or it might be $20. This is uncertainty about the rules of the game. So not about a parameter, but about... You know, if you're, a math if you're a mathematician about the equations themselves. Um, I'm going to talk about that in the European context, looking at one particular market design which is important in Europe and maybe not so important here, but you have many of these things here in Chile. So you're thinking about establishing a balancing market or establishing markets for ancillary services in general that currently do not exist. That's not a parametric uncertainty. That's a structural uncertainty. It's something that's going to have a major impact on the profits of generators. Um, but it's also fundamentally unpredictable. Um, you might at some point move, so Chilean markets are cost, well, at least the regulator thinks they're cost-based. Um, uh, maybe at some point in the future, it will be a more liberalized bid-based market. Again, that's a change in the rules of the game. Um, we just talked about this over lunch. There are no, if you're, if you're, if you're familiar with energy markets, there are no financial transmission rights in Chile. Um, will you have them in the future? Will there be a capacity market? These kinds of things. Um, oh, just air conditioning. <laughs> so so I, I, I would argue that these are the most important uncertainties if you're an investor because they're idiosyncratic, they can't easily be hatched, they have a major impact on your revenues. Uh, but also, not many people look at them because it's really hard. Because parametric uncertainties are easy. You know, we know how to do stochastic models. But these are uncertainties about the equations, not about the, the, 
the parameters. Um, so I, I, I want to look at two different things, but I'm going to look at that in the European context because that's how we wrote this paper. Uh, and a particular market design uncertainty I'm going to be looking at is how many prices are there going to be. So what tends to be the case in European electricity markets is that there is, in each period, there is one price for a whole country. So any transmission constraints within the country are completely ignored by the market. That's a system operator later resolves them. So whether I buy or sell electricity in the north of, in the north of Scotland or in the south of England, it's, it is one market. I get the same price. Despite the fact that actually there might be congestion between the two zones and it might be much more expensive to produce electricity in England than it is in Scotland, but the market doesn't consider this. There's one price. Um, US markets tend to have the other extreme, which is called nodal pricing. So there's a, there's a potentially different price at every point in the network, which reflects the local marginal cost of producing electricity. So if I'm in a zone where there's a lot of wind generation, which has a near zero marginal cost, uh, and uh, my transmission network is congested, so I cannot export that electricity anywhere, and then the price will go to zero in that specific location. Um, and if I'm somewhere else, or I'm import constrained, and I only have really expensive local generation to satisfy an additional unit of demand, the price will go much higher. So, so, but in Europe, we don't tend to have that. There's, there's one price per country, and the system operator spends a lot of time after the market has done its job to fix it. Um, but we're always talking about, should we change this? So should we change from what's, what's a, a uniform, or if you want zonal pricing, to a, to a nodal pricing system? So should we have, essentially the question is, should we have better locational price signals? Um, and uh, uh, so that's the particular market design element I'm going to be talking about, and I want to show two things. First of all, I want to see how uncertainty about this market design affects investment. So the fact that people don't know whether we are going to change the market design or not, whether we're going to stick with our current uniform price or move to something that has a better locational price signal. Because you know, we're talking about it, so it's clearly a possibility. So I think it should have an effect on investment now, so, and, and I'm, I'm going to try and show that. And then secondly, I want to look at how that, that uncertainty interacts with other uncertainties such as the ones you mentioned about fuel prices and about demand and about carbon prices and these kinds of things. Oh, there's a lot of congestion. System operators spend millions and millions of euros resolving them. Because, um, I mean, the, the, way to, the, the classic way to resolve congestion is so about one hour before electricity is due to be delivered, everybody tells the system operator what they're going to do. System operator runs a model to see if that's actually feasible or if it's gonna, the network's going to be congested. It's usually not going to be feasible. And what they then have to do is they will have to tell one generator to back off on one side of a constraint and on the other side of a constraint, ask a generator to increase, and they pay the difference in, in prices. Um, so uh, no doubt about it. So in the UK, the main constraint is, for instance, between Scotland, where the wind resource is very good, and England, where most of the demand is. Same thing in Germany. Uh, good wind resource in the north, demand in the south, con uh, congestion between them. So, so this is a, I mean, this, this is something that costs... So, so it... I don't know what it's like, what it is in Chile, but in the UK and in Germany also, a consumer's electricity bill, about one third of the cost is network management costs. Okay, so this is a significant issue, which could potentially be resolved if we had better locational price signals because that would, well, it would solve things in the short term, but in the longer term, it would incentivize generators to go to the locations where there is scarcity. Um, anyway, so let's look at the first thing. Um, so the fact that there is uncertainty about what the market is going to, structural uncertainty, so uncertainty about the future market structure, how, does, how is that going to affect investment? Um, and okay, this kind of partly answers your question as well, is that there, see some newspaper, newspaper articles saying, you know, are we going to have 20 different electricity prices in Germany? Um, uh, and uh, it, it's clearly, it, it, it seems to come back in cycles about every five years. We have another one of these where people say we should really have better locational price signals. And then policymakers decide not to do it. And then, so we're now in, in, a, in kind of on the top of one of these cycles where everybody's discussing it again. And probably five years from now, it will be somewhere else. Um, okay. So I'm not going to talk about this very much. 
uh, uh, just to say that, that this is a problem that hasn't really been studied. So, so there's, a, there's quite a lot of literature about the effects of regulatory uncertainty on investment, but it's always about these parameters, about things like future carbon targets, future renewable support schemes, whether nuclear generation will be allowed or not, um, those kinds of things. So, so nobody's really talking about this, about the rules, uncertainty about the rules of the game. Um, but we do know generally from a lot of studies that, that better locational price signals are a good thing. Those are two things. So, so especially that, that last, keep that in mind. So nodal pricing is more economically efficient, generally, uh, unless there are some other market failures. So better locational price signals lead to better inf investment in the places where it's needed, and it leads to better utilization of existing capacity. So um, right, let's uh, have a model. So it needs to be quite a complicated model because we are trying to replicate a European-style electricity market. So uh, we start out with a, a four-stage model. Um, in the first stage, there is a transmission planner who decides where to build new lines or which lines to upgrade. Uh, we assume, as everybody does, that this is essentially the regulator and the maximized social surplus um, because this is generally not done by the private sector. So, so that's the first stage. At that point, we don't know what the future market's gonna look like. It might be nodal pricing, it might be uniform pricing. Second stage is after the uh, transmission network has been decided, the generators, which are private firms, decide where to build new power plants. And they maximize their profits. They're competitive firms. Uh, still, we don't know what the future market's gonna look like. So all investment decisions are made when we don't yet know what the market's going to look like. Uh, then at some point we'll find out, we'll find out if policymakers actually go through with the change or not. Uh, and then there is a spot, there is electricity market operation essentially, so all the capacity that has been invested in, in the first stages is used. And then the fourth stage is redispatch, which is this, the system operator essentially making sure everything's feasible, so doing this counter trading, fixing the, fixing the mistakes that the market has made. Okay, so that's, is the timeline relatively clear? We're going to assume it's a perfectly competitive market, so it doesn't matter. Um, if we don't assume it's a perfectly competitive market, all of this becomes pretty much impossible to solve, but we're, we have a model where uh, we can talk about it later. Um, so there's one investment decision for the transmission operators, one investment decision for the generators, and then we simulate a number of time periods of market operation to capture variable renewables and variable demand. Um, but the, the, the key thing is the investment decisions are made under uncertainty. We don't yet know if there's going to be one price for the whole country, ignoring the transmission constraints, or there are going to be different prices in the, di different places. So, okay, this is a four-level model. Um, if you do kind of uh, planning models, you know that basically we can't really solve this. Um, so we have to do some work to uh, make this a little bit easier. So uh, first stage is, is that we can uh, uh, make it into a three-level model by assuming that the generation firms are perfectly competitive. Um, so that means that instead of modeling each generator separately, we can just uh, 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 do a kind of one-shot thing where we minimize the cost or, or maximize social surplus. And we can then also combine a generation investment and a spot market operation. These are two decisions that generators make. Generators decide how to invest and how to use that capacity. Uh, so we don't need them as separate problems, we can, put them, uh, we can put them together. Essentially, it means that generators invest, but when they invest, they also already think about how they're going to use that capacity at the same time. Um, so, so we can combine this into one. So then we've got, three, we've got a three-level problem, which is better, um, where in the upper level, uh, there's a transmission planner maximizing welfare, Second level, there are generation firms who maximize their profits, but they're perfectly competitive, so we can model that as one optimization problem. And in the third stage, it's the system operator again who, who, who minimizes the cost of redispatch. So three levels is better than four, but it's not good enough because uh, we still can't really solve large instances of this. Um, so we have to be a little bit smart about this. Uh, so the first thing we do is this upper level transmission investment, we discretize it. So instead of saying a transmission operator has a con has continuous variable, it can decide what capacity to install everywhere, we say it has a limited number of options, which is pretty realistic because you cannot build a line of any capacity, you either build it or you don't. 
So we discretize the upper level, and then we can, if we're not particularly smart about it, we can just solve the lower two levels for all different uh, uh, upper level decisions. Uh, that works in a small network. That's actually what we do in the paper. But if we have a larger network, you cannot enumerate all possibilities, but you can use ADMM or your favorite decomposition algorithm to solve it. Um, so we discretize the upper level. Um, and then we are left with a bi-level problem, which we could solve. Um, but um, there's another thing that's really convenient, which is, uh, so uh, definitely in Germany, the way these redispatch markets work, so, so the way that the system operator redispatches generation is that this is cost-based. So if you are a generator and you're asked to reduce your production because otherwise you would violate a constraint, you're only, that doesn't impact your profits. You're reimbursed for your costs, but not more. So this is not the case in the UK. This is the case in Germany. So if we are willing to assume that essentially everything that the system operator does to make things feasible doesn't affect the generator's profits, it means there's only a unidirectional link between those two stages and we can actually solve them simultaneously. We can also solve them in sequence rather than solve them simultaneously. So redispatch, when the generators decide how to bid in a the market, they don't have to consider the redispatch stage because it doesn't impact their profits. Of course, how you redispatch depends on what the generators have done, but you can solve these two things sequentially rather than simultaneously. So we discretize the upper level, solve these two problems sequentially for all different upper level decisions. If it's a small network, if it's a larger network, you have to use some kind of decomposition algorithm to do it. Okay. Um, so that's what we do. Um, so, so essentially exploiting the fact that the relationships between those stages are sparse. Um, and then we have this, we can, we can uh, we, well, not quite parameterize, but we can include this uncertainty about future market designs by um, having scenario-specific sets, which sounds a little bit abstract, and I'm not going to explain it, but if you want to read the paper, I can send it to you. Uh, but essentially, it means that this uncertainty about the future market designs, so there's uncertainty about whether there will be one price or several prices, um, it means we have, a market we have a number of market clearing constraints and uh, they sum generation over a number of generators and that set depends on which scenario we're in. Yes. Uh, so, it, yeah, so it's a different set of market clearing constraints in the... Um, so in this, in this middle problem, so it, this middle problem is a is a, a market equilibrium. So in that market equilibrium, we have market clearing constraints. So we either have one market clearing constraints if we have uniform pricing, there's one price for the whole market, or we have a separate market clearing constraints at every bus. And the, one way to operationalize this is to have a separate set of market clearing constraints for every bus, but to sum over a different number of generators depending on which system you're in. Um, congestion is here. So, so the, well, it depends which market you're in. If you're in a uniform pricing market, then this a market equilibrium is calculated without uh, considering any congestion. And then it has to be solved here by the TSO. If you're in a nodal pricing market, then the congestion is taken into account here because instead of having one market clearing constraint, you'll have one separately for each bus. And then essentially you don't even need this unless there is uncertainty about wind production. Is that clear? Yeah. So if you've already, if you have, comp if you have perfect nodal pricing, that's already included here in this. You only need this if there is when you do this, there is still some uncertainty about wind production or something. So in the real world, you still need this even if you have nodal pricing, but you don't do very much there. In our model, we simplify everything, so if there is nodal pricing, this last stage is essentially unnecessary. Yeah, no? They will choose, so firms will choose where to, invest, where to invest in new capacity, and once they have that capacity, they will choose how to operate it. Um, uh, 
perfect competition yields the welfare maximizing location if there are locational price signals in the market. That's, that's going to be a key driver of results. If, there are no, if, if I say the price you get for your electricity is the same everywhere, you're just going to go to the place where it's cheapest to build, which might not be the best place from a system perspective. Okay. Um, right. So here's a simple example of two buses, because if, as soon as you add a third, you have loop flows and things go to hell. Um, and we look at, a, in a simple example, we look at a greenfield approach to so say, we, could, we could have these two buses currently, but there's no generation capacity at all, and there's no transmission capacity. So we start from nothing. Uh, of course, in the real world, you start from something, but that just makes it more complicated. Um, we have a number of different time periods that we model in market operation, um, between 20 and 200. Um, and we assume that uh, electricity demand is, does depend on prices. Uh, this, this generally, when people do expansion planning model, they don't include that, but um, uh, in our case, it's, it makes, it makes a, solving it a little bit easier. But, but we assume that demand is fairly inelastic. Responds, to, responds a little bit to prices, but not very much. Um, so I have two, two notes. So this is supposed to look a little bit like Germany or like the UK. So I have two buses, one or two, one and two. Uh, most of the demand is in the south, uh, but the good wind resource is in the north. Um, so here's some costs, but the, the, I mean, the, they don't really matter. Uh, we look at two different cases. Uh, one case where there's a, a very low carbon price, and that's going to result in a system that is dominated by fossil fuels. The other scenario, the only difference is there's a higher CO2 price, so it changes the relative cost of renewables and non-renewables, so that will result in a system that has more renewables. And we could have set up systems in different ways, but this is how we, so we essentially we want to compare a system that's going to have a lot of renewables and a system that doesn't, just to look at two different cases. And, and, and the way we force that is by having a high and a low carbon price. It's actually not that high a carbon price, because this is more or less where we are now at the moment, but OK. Um, OK, so remember north? Well, higher than in Chile, but that, given the Chilean system, that's probably a good thing. Um, so in the north, good wind. In the south, more demand. Um, and uh, OK, so we assume that uh, there's regular, this, this, so there's uncertainty about whether, when we come to market operation, there will be one price for the whole country, so one price for both zones, or whether there will be a separate one. So here, nodal pricing means we have two prices, and uniform pricing means we have one. Uh, and we assume that everybody has the same expectation. So we assume that all market participants have a think there is a probability of one or two of these things happening, but they all have the same probability. Uh, you could generalize this to different probabilities, but um, uh, okay. So um, there's lots of results, but I, I just want to highlight a few interesting ones. So here's the results for a low CO2 price. So it's, it's a system which is mostly dominated by fossil fuels. Colors, colors don't come out fantastically here, but uh, we have a bit of wind here, and we have a bit of coal. Uh, so all the solid things are things in the north node, where the wind resource is good, but demand is low. And all the, da all the things that are dotted or dashed or whatever are in the south node, where the wind is uh, less good, but demand is higher. Um, it's capacity on these axes in, cases you can't, in case you can't read it. And here's the probability of having two prices. So zero means that everybody expects we will in the future still have uniform one price. One means that everybody is absolutely convinced that we will have nodal pricing and everything in between. It, it, this, is, this does not depend on what's actually going to happen, right? This is people's expectations. Um, and they're the same for everybody. So one means everybody is absolutely sure that when we come to market, so we invest now, when we come to market operation, there will be two prices. So what we see, which you probably, and oh, this is a generation capacity, this is a network investment. It's only one line, so it's, the, it's just in megawatts. Um, what you might be able to see, but maybe not very well because the colors don't come out, is that even if we're sort of up here, so up here means there's a very small probability that we will have two prices, a very small probability that there will be nodal prices. If we go from zero, which is definitely not gonna happen to very small probability, there's already a major change. So transmission investment is reduced a lot. 
And it's reduced a lot because the transmission system operator knows it anticipates generation investment. And, and it knows that there's going to be a shift in gas-fired generation from the north node to the south node. So again, you cannot see this very well, but this blue here is, is gas at node one that completely disappears, even if there is a small probability of, of two prices. Um, and instead, we have this a much larger blue dashed, which is gas at node two. So even if there is a very small probability of two price zones, there's already a major change compared to no probability at all. Which is easy to understand because for gas-fired generators, they don't, their costs don't depend on where they are located. Building a gas-fired generator costs the same whether I'm in the north or in the south, which is also generally true in the real world. So if there is even a small possibility that prices are going to be higher somewhere, my cost, you know, in terms of cost, I don't care. So if there's a small probability that one, one location is going to give me a slightly higher profit, I'm going to go there. If it turns out that actually there's only going to be one price, well, it doesn't matter. I don't lose anything. But if there are two prices, I gain a lot because I'm now in the high price zone. So that's why you get this shift in gas-fired generation from the north to the south. Is, is they, they, don't need any, they don't need a big incentive. They're, you know, if there's a zero probability, they're pretty much, they don't care where they go. They could go in either location, they would make the same profit. As long as there's a small probability that one location is going to be more profitable, that's enough for them to shift. And that's also the reason that network investment decreases quite significantly, because essentially gas-fired generators are going to go in the right place. Um, if we look at the same results, but for the high CO2 price, so there's a lot more wind. Again, you can't see this very well. There's a lot more wind here. This is all wind. That's not the case. It's only if the probabilities are really high that I get a switch from this is wind, this bar is wind at the northern node where the resource is good, this is wind in the southern node where the, where the wind is not that good. So I need a pretty significant possibility for the wind to switch because they actually prefer to be in the north. They're not agnostic where they are. They want to be in a good resource zone. So they need, a, they need to be relatively sure that there's going to be a higher price down south for them to move because their costs are lower in the north. Um, so only if the probabilities are quite high, then we get a significant locational switch and, and also only then do we see this reduction in network capacity. Um, okay, so that's one result. I want to briefly discuss the welfare effect. So these figures are, uh, again, there's a lot of information there. So there's social surplus. Um, again, here I've got a probability between zero and one of having two prices. And, uh, and now I have to consider, if I want to evaluate welfare, I have to evaluate two cases. I have to evaluate what happens when people have a particular expectation and actually policymaker doesn't go through with the new policy and we have one price zone. Those are the orange bars. Uh, those are the uh, blue bars, sorry. And then the orange bars is what if we actually end up in a situation with two prices. So it's possible that people really expect this change to happen, so they have a very high possibility, probability, but actually the change doesn't happen. So if, if everybody thinks it's 90% sure that we're going to have two prices, but actually we stick with one price, then we are in the blue bar here. If people are 90% sure the change is going to happen and it actually happens, then we're in the orange bar. This side is a uh, uh, fossil fuel system, low carbon price. One on the right is more renewables. So if we have a kind of fossil fuel-based system, um, what's most interesting to note is how small the difference between the orange and blue bars are. So obviously I can get the maximum welfare, because we know that nodal pricing is more economically efficient, I can get the maximum welfare as everybody expects two prices and the two prices actually happen. So this orange bar is the best we can do. Um, but actually, if everybody expects it and we don't do it, we're not that much lower. And indeed, if people expect it with a relatively low probability and it doesn't happen, we're also not that much lower. Um, on the other side, if I have a mostly renewable-based system, this is not the case. So if I have a most renewable system, the, the difference between those bars is much larger. So there, if I have a system with a lot of renewables, I actually need nodal pricing to get maximum economic efficiency because I have variable renewables and I need to dispatch efficiently. Um, 
But in a mostly fossil fuel-based system, actually, the biggest benefit is, is already achieved if people have a small, you know, if people expect nodal pricing with a relatively low probability. So it's due to two, two things. One, one, one is that, that for wind, it's location, it's cost dependent on location. But the other thing is that in a renewable-based system, it's more important to have an efficient dispatch. So it's, those two th it, it's, it's both the efficient investment, but it's also the fact that I, there's more benefits to having a more efficient dispatch in a system which has a lot of wind. Um, Okay, I mean, there's some prices which are not particularly interesting, so I'm going to skip them because I'm already late. Um, so what's the implication of this? So, well, first of all, I think this, this structural, this uncertainty about the rules of the game is important. Um, there's a second thing which you can kind of look at from two, if you're, depending on whether you're a negative or a positive person. If you're a positive person, you could say, when we are in Europe and we're discussing nodal pricing, or in Chile when you're discussing more, when you're discussing bid-based systems or more efficient systems, maybe just by talking about it, we already get a significant amount of the benefits. Because by talking about it, we make people realize that maybe it's going to happen in the future. And since what drives investment is not current policies, but people's expectations of policies, um, it's already going to change investment. That's particularly true if you have a system which, which has a lot of fossil fuel-based uh, generators who are kind of agnostic in terms of location. Okay, because we look at a location-based market design, we, we could look at other Chilean case studies if you want to. So, so if you're a positive person, you might say, you know, it's important to discuss these policies, but, but like, even if we cannot convince policymakers to do the right thing, maybe we already get some of the benefits. Um, so that's one way you can look at it, but, but I think also as academics, there's another way of looking at it as saying, you know, before these kind of market design changes happen, there are always all these studies that try to quantify the benefits of doing it, right? When you do these kinds of studies, you should take into account whether people are already expecting it. Because if people are already expecting it, then maybe the actual benefits of doing it are kind of small. So, so when you, it, it's not just enough to run your model and see actually this system the, the, new, the new market design is going to be much more efficient than the existing market design. You need to know whether people are already expecting it, because if they're already expecting it, maybe their behavior is already, already gives you a lot of the benefits. It's like stock markets. You know, if, you, if, if there's some kind of shock in stock markets where people are expecting it to happen, then nothing happens to prices. And, and so it's kind of obvious, but I think it's the same thing with policies. If people are already expecting it, then nothing happens. Um, Having said that, I don't think you can actually use this as a policy itself. So I don't think as, a, as an energy regulator you can continue to make people believe that you're going to do something and never do it. So, 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 that, so you cannot say, okay, we're going to have nodal pricing next year. And then when next year comes, you say, oh, no, it's going to be next year. And you can do this bond, maybe twice. But, but in, in the long term, expectations cannot be different from reality forever. Okay, so, you, so, so you, deliberately inducing this risk cannot be a long term policy tool, but, but maybe you shouldn't shut down the discussion, at least. Yeah, yeah, but th 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 this is about what happens before that, before you announce the policy. True, true, and things move slowly in energy markets. Um, but this is about what happens before that. I mean, you, the, the, a policy is never announced out of the blue. I think we, we will have nodal pricing in Europe at some point. It might take 10 years or it might take 20 years, but we will have it at some point, I think. Uh, that doesn't, by the way, doesn't mean that this regulatory uncertainty is ever resolved, because I'm sure as soon as we have it, someone's going to argue that we need to revert to uniform pricing which is currently happening in gas markets in Europe, because European gas markets have nodal pricing, and the regulators are thinking about making it uniform pricing. So, uh, but gas is weird, so uh, there are other reasons for that. No. 
No. Um, So the probability, the probability in this model is is a, is a kind of Bayesian probability. So it's it's what people it's the people's expect. It has nothing to do with the actual. I mean, the actual probability if you're a Bayesian doesn't exist yet. So it's people's expectation. Um, so it's it's it might bear no really. You'd hope that it has some relation with the actual probability, but since we don't know what the actual probability is, we cannot say anything about that. But it, I mean, the conclusion doesn't depend on the greenfield approach. It's just stronger the more investment there is. If we're in a system with a reducing demand and already sufficient generation capacity to meet demand, there's not going to be any investment. So therefore, this is not important. But in most market, most energy markets, we need a significant amount of investment over the next 10, 20 years. So, so I think the real world is not greenfield, but it's especially in systems that have committed to you know, carbon neutral by 2045 or something, it's pretty much greenfield. Okay, any other questions about this? I'll just briefly show you some other thing. Um, because we, so you notice in this, uh, in all of this, I haven't talked about risk. Um, actually, I, uh, we struggled with this for a long time in saying how, because in reality also investors are risk averse. And here we assume they're risk neutral Turns out we actually already have these results uh, because uh, for the mathematicians in the room, if we use a coherent risk measure such as a CVAR to quantify risk, here there are only two possibilities. The CVAR will put a higher weight. You can translate the CVAR into a change in probability, so you put a higher probability in the worst case. Here we already know what the worst case is going to be. It's going to be zonal pricing. So if I'm risk averse, then I can just adjust these probabilities. If you didn't follow that, then don't worry about it. But anyway, we have the results for risk aversion. You just need to look at you just need to look up in this table. So if your real probability is 60%, is but you're risk averse, then we can translate that into a, a, a lower probability. Anyway. Um, but of course, there are also lots of other uncertainties. So in the second paper, um, we look at kind of what's happened after the market design has been decided. So now we are either in a US style nodal pricing market or we're in a European style. Um, uniform pricing market. There's no uncertainty anymore about that, but there is uncertainty about lots of other things. Um, and particularly, there's uncertainty about demand levels, there's uncertainty about where demand is going to be, maybe because we don't know where people are going to buy electric vehicles or whatever. There's uncertainty about the CO2 price, and there's uncertainty, might be uncertainty about transmission costs. Um, so you might have to commit to building a line, but then actually, because it takes 10 years to build, you might have significant cost overruns, as is usual with these things. So what we want to know now is we are now in, in one of these market designs. Where is the risk going to be the highest? And where is risk aversion going to have the biggest effect? Uh, this is mostly driven by the fact that there is now some literature on risk aversion and in, in, in investment in electricity markets. Um, but it's always nodal pricing. It's always US style. And, and we kind of wanted to know is risk, are, there, are, there, are there typical risks to investors really different depending on which market design we're in? Um, so yeah, it's still Greenfield, it's still pretty much the same model, so it's still this four-stage model which we managed to collapse. So we have an investment plan. Um, uh, and generation, so we have transmission investment, generation investment, spot market trading, and if we're in a uniform pricing market, that's followed by a redispatch stage. So it's the same model, but the uncertainty is now no longer about the market design. We now know which one we're in. We want to see how that, the other uncertainties change depending on which of the two situations we're in. Uh, okay, so again, we have a two -node, same two-node model, but now we have slightly different costs and slightly different on the, because we now have different uncertainties. Uh, this, by the way, is really new, so I haven't got really pretty pictures yet. Um, I just want to highlight a few conclusions, um, uh, but, but I literally got this yesterday. So, um, uh, but they, they are what we expected. First conclusion is that, so okay, here are some tables. Um, this uh, omega is, uh, so what we're assuming here now is that all generators on transmission plans are risk averse. So instead of maximizing expected profits or expected social welfare, they maximize a weighted average of 
expected, and worst case, uh, so a weighted average of the expected cost and the condition of value at risk of the cost distribution, or profit distribution, or welfare distribution, whatever. Um, so this omega, if this omega is zero, then, I'm then everybody's risk neutral. If, if omega is close to one, uh, we can't solve one for reasons I can explain if you're really interested. Uh, it means you really only care about the worst alpha percent of cases. I can't remember what we said alpha to. It's like the worst 5% of cases. Uh, and if I'm somewhere in the middle, then I put a higher weight on the worst cases, but I still consider the other ones. So more risk averse as we go down the table. Um, there are prices. That, okay, so one, one interesting thing is when, when you have risk aversion, then prices are no longer a good measure for consumer surplus. So higher prices doesn't necessarily mean consumers are unhappy. Higher prices might be higher in expected terms, but if, if you decrease the, the, the scenarios in which the prices are really high, they might still be happy. Anyway, the important column to look at, uh, so this is welfare, uh, uh, welfare differences uh, compared to risk neutrality. So obviously, as we become more and more risk averse, then welfare decreases for two reasons. One is people are probably going to want to invest less as they're more risk averse. And the other one is because we put a higher weight on the worst cases, by definition, welfare is going to decrease because of that. So our metric changes, but also the decisions change. So therefore, in this, this table with the delta W investment, we have to tidy up our notation. This is the welfare difference just because investment changes with risk aversion. So if people are more risk averse, if everybody's more risk averse, there's generally less investment or different types of investment. Um, and, and this is the welfare loss because of that. And as you can see, it's significantly higher on the nodal pricing than on the zonal pricing. Um, there are various reasons for that, which I don't have time to explain, and I haven't fully understood them myself. Uh, but it's kind of consistent with what we expected. Risk aversion has a bigger effect in American-style nodal pricing markets. Uh, which is kind of interesting, because what we also see is that in American-style American nodal pricing markets, there are gazillions of financial products that are traded in addition to energy. You can buy all sorts of options and swaps and whatnot. And in Europe, these are not really popular. Maybe this is why. Maybe it's because the risks, risk aversion actually has a bigger impact in US style markets. So you need all these financial products to uh, make everybody happy, which is interesting for Chile because Chile has a, well, sort of US style nodal pricing market, uh, but it doesn't have any financial instruments. So, so Chile is like probably somewhere on this side, with n nothing to mitigate it. Whereas in the US, there, are, there is financial trading going on. Um, we assume here, by the way, we assume, we assume here that there is financial, there is perfect financial trading. There, there, well, okay, maybe I will, I will try to explain it a little bit. Um, so here is the generation transmission investment. Um, okay, maybe I'm not going to use this, I'm not going to use this. Okay, I don't have a good picture to explain. In a nodal pricing system, so remember this is a Stackelberg type model where the transmission planner goes first. And at the transmission planner maximizes social welfare and after that we have a competitive market. In a zonal pricing network, the transmission planner can build more transmission, but it's not going to influence generation investment. Okay. In a nodal pricing market, if the transmission planner builds more lines, so easing congestion, it will decrease the price difference between the two nodes. So in a nodal pricing market, the transmission operator can sort of steer investment even if the market, so if the market is very risk averse and doesn't want to invest, the system operator can almost make them invest by changing the prices with the only instrument they have, the, the capacity. So, so that's one reason. Um, so, so that's kind of what you see here. So if we become more risk averse, so at uh, top is uniform pricing, uh, nothing really changes very much to network. So network, network investment decreases a little bit because the transmission system operator is also risk averse, wants, wants to reduce the risk of stranded asset, but it doesn't really decrease that much. Uh, it's the other way around here, by the way. So we, did, if, if we go, so risk neutral is at the bottom. So we increase investment a little bit. Um, 
and there's not a huge change in generation capacity. In the nodal pricing network, as we become more risk averse, then first there is a, as we become a little bit risk averse, there's a big increase in generation capacity, which is to accommodate for a switch to wind. So in our particular model, if you're risk averse, uh, because one of our uncertainties is, carbon, is the carbon price, wind is a hedge against future high carbon prices. So if the generators are risk averse, you, so this is wind, so there's much more investment in wind, and the, generation, and the transmission planner increases generation capacity to accommodate it. If everybody becomes really risk averse, then, then um, network capacity reduces again for the reason that the transmission planner doesn't want to be stuck with a stranded asset. Um, so, so a nodal pricing market, because it has these locational price signals, is more flexible in a way. Um, but that also, and the transmission planner has more power, but that also means that risk aversion has a bigger impact. The best way I can explain it. Uh, anyway, I'm almost out of time. So uh, that was one conclusion, is that risk aversion generally has a larger effect in nodal markets. This is one example. We've looked at quite a wide range of parameters. Um, the benefits, again, this is one of these conclusions if you're doing policy analysis. Uh, I'm not going to try and explain this figure because I don't have time. The benefits of a change from uniform to nodal pricing depend on how risk averse everybody is. So not only when you do these kinds of analysis of, market, of the benefits of a market design change, not only should you take into account whether it's already expected, you should also take into account how risk averse people are because that can have a major impact on the difference. And finally, uh, we look at a situation where we look at what happens if the transmission planner is a bit stupid and ignores the fact that the generation investors are risk averse. So this is arguably current situation. This transmission expansion planning is done not considering any risk aversion. They just run a simple expansion model. If you ignore something that's actually true, then obviously that decreases welfare. So uh, it, this is the level of risk aversion in the market. This is line investment of a transmission operator who's smart. This is line investment of a transmission operator who's stupid. Uh, and, and ignoring risk aversion in the market is much worse if you have nodal pricing, which again makes sense. If you're, a trans if you're in a zonal pricing market and you're a transmission planner and you get things wrong, then the worst that can happen is you build too little transmission or too much. Too little transmission, okay, maybe not that it increases your redispatch costs, but it's not going to be that important. Too much transmission, okay, you spend a bit too much money. If you're in a nodal pricing market and as a transmission system operator you ignore something and you get things wrong, not only do you build too little or too much transmission, increasing your redispatch costs or your investment cost, you also mess up the generation investment. Because what you do directly impacts prices and therefore directly impacts generation investors. So even though risk aversion is maybe less important in a zonal pricing market, in a nodal pricing market, uh, in a nodal pricing market, transmission system operators really have to make sure they know what the market, what, what the generation investors are maximizing. Um, there's much more I can say about this, I won't, but um, again, some implications of this is that when you're evaluating market design, take into account whether people are ex already expecting it, but also what the level of risk aversion is. Um, perhaps nodal pricing markets need more financial instruments to hedge that additional risk which is a message for Chile, I suppose. Um, but in nodal pricing markets, transmission planners also need to be more careful. And, and, and if you're doing some modeling to inform transmission planning in Chile, for instance, then maybe this is something you should take into account. Right, and I'm out of time. So thanks very much. The first uh, thing, uh, the first uh, paper, is a, uh, paper is already available as a working paper, hopefully soon as a journal article. Second one should come out as a working paper Well, whenever I have had time to finish it sometime before Christmas. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, what I didn't mention is, 
is that throughout this, we assume that there is perfect financial trading. So there exist Aradabra securities for every possible future scenario, and they are traded. So, so this is a situation with perfect, with per, with perfect uh, financial markets. So Chile is going to be much worse than this. What's the, yeah, so, so it's really, really hard to model uh, imperfect, well, as you know, it's really hard to model imperfect markets, but especially if you have an energy, even if you have a perfectly competitive energy market, but an incomplete financial market, there's only one paper I know who does that, and they, they don't consider it a network because it becomes too complicated. Um, I, I, I have a theory about the way you could do it, but I haven't got around to doing it, but it's very difficult. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's a good point that, um, in these types of situations, the benefits of financial hedging are, are, are very large. And, and the most puzzling thing about Chilean energy markets, I always think, is that nobody seems to, no, no banks seem to be interested in offering them. So why? I don't know. Do the generators not know that they need these things, or do the banks not understand the energy markets? Or, or I don't know. So, someone can make a lot of money here. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no risk here at all, of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I know where you're coming from because I know the Chilean government has just fixed the electricity price for the next two years. But, but I don't see... This is what happens if you do things optimally. So how can you get cheaper electricity if you do it less... Opt if, you do, if, if you have some, any kind of second-best solution, we'll have a higher electricity price. So, so the only way that, that you can lower electricity prices is by subsidizing it. But you know, if you want to do that, don't just do it. Don't mess with, the, don't mess with investment. But there is no way you can... What I'm saying is if, you're, if you make decisions optimally, there is no way you can decrease costs by doing anything because that's the definition of the optimum. So if, if it's not politically acceptable to have an electricity price above a certain level, then you have to be willing to subsidize. And ideally, you should do that outside the energy market so give the money directly to the consumers to avoid messing up your energy market equilibrium. This is something that governments don't understand. So in the same framework of Europe, it's useful to, to see the impact of this kind of suboptimal thing. For example, let's suppose that you could have a future with another price, or a future with another price, and with this... That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, but, but I think the point I was trying to make is that it, it doesn't just, if it's consumer, because it's consumer prices that you care about, there are multiple ways to make sure that the consumer price doesn't go above a certain level. One way is to just let the en wholesale energy market do what it wants to do and then subsidize the consumers, reduce taxes or whatever. It's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But the other way is to, to change the wholesale market and to say in the wholesale market it's going to be a price cap. And, and that is going to, so that you could put in this model and see what the impact of this is. That, that I agree with. But then it depends on, you can, you can do, I'm not opposed to <laughs> subsidies, but I'm opposed to subsidies that mess up a, a, a market. Um, but, but yeah, so, so this is, this is what, I mean, the, the more complicated one is how to deal with fuel poverty, which... Yeah, so if there are people who cannot who cannot pay, but only some people who cannot pay, and I want to protect them, then then how do I do that without messing up the market? But yeah, if you could. Um, so yeah. The Sorry. The yeah, I think politicians are a bit busy right now. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, your carbon pricing system. Like, if if you can get to that. 
that level of messed up economics, then maybe there isn't a lot of hope for energy markets. But um, thank you very much, Harry. You're welcome. And if you have a good ap application of something to a particular element of the Chilean market, then please please send me an email or something. And, uh,